and welcome back to my channel. Welcome! Today I'm doing something that I've wanted to do for a long time, which is to talk about the difference between modification and accommodation. In special ed, these terms are thrown around all the time, and I remember being in college and learning about them, but not really seeing them in action. To start off, usually people have some sort of curriculum that they use for their school, for general education. Because I'm talking to all of you guys, and we all probably have different types of curriculum for different things, I'm going to use a website that I love that provides a lot of supplemental types of activities for students. Super Teachers is phenomenal. I am not sponsored, I'm just a huge, huge fan. This website does have a little bit of a membership fee, but it's like $20 for the whole year. And uh, it's definitely great to supplement your lessons, to provide more work in case you need more morning work or homework or whatever. So just to make that clear, I'm gonna use their resources to kind of demonstrate the differences between modifications and accommodations. Really quickly, what is the difference between a modification and an accommodation? If I were to put it really, really loosely, an accommodation is how and a modification is what. An accommodation is how the student is learning the materials a modification is what the student is expected to learn and what materials they're going to have. Tricky. So in special ed, we provide both. Sometimes a student might not need modifications. They might only need accommodations. And sometimes a student needs the whole gamut. They need as many things as you can give them. In an IEP, it depends on the state. Some states write them out, they list them out in one section. Other states have them embedded in the goals and in the benchmarks. A lot of times in a 504 plan, you really just need those for accommodations. Modifications are a change in the actual content of what the child is expected to know. All right. Let's get into some examples. Let's say my third grade class is learning about common and proper nouns. 18 out of the 23 students are working on that level, that general education grade level, common and proper nouns. They're able to distinguish between the two. I have seven students who are at different levels than the rest of the students. Two of my students might just need an accommodation. They might have needed the list of words ahead of time the night before. They might need them in larger print versus smaller print. When we're doing an activity together, they might just need a few more verbal prompts and cues from me. That's it. And I also might have three students in my classroom that need it to be modified. They might actually need less work. So they're working just as hard on the problems that they have, but they might only need uh, five problems, first 20. For some, I might actually cut that list of words they're getting tested in half. Instead of writing the words, they might just need different manipulatives or letter cards to spell out the words. While others are working on proper nouns, I might have a few that are just working on CVC words. They're still working hard. They're still learning new content. They're still within the parameters of grammar and understanding, but they're working on different types of words. And with that, I might also give them flashcards we might be playing different games and activities related to those sight words. We might be spending more time and uh, instead of just learning to repeat the word, we're gonna find other type of tactile, uh, manipulative type of ways for them to remember, to sound it out. When it comes time to test these words, uh, my accommodation folks might just need to go to a different corner they might just do their work uh, in a quieter place with headphones on and they might need a bit more time. And we might be working on the same words for four weeks while the rest of the peers are working on new words each week. All right, my second example. It's time to write some sort of personal narrative. 
and for my class of 25, uh, 18 or 19 of them are going to use some type of graphic organizer to start them off. I'm gonna explain the directions and I'm just gonna give them the graphic organizer and they're gonna take their time in planning out what they wanna write. Two or three of them might need an accommodation. They might need additional cues from me. They, they might just need a little bit more time. So giving them an extra 20, 30 minutes to work on it. I might also have a few students who can't even access this at all. <laughs> and they might need a different type of graphic organizer. Instead of writing out their personal narratives, they might draw their personal narratives for me. They might um, tell me the story and I might scribe for them. They might have a chance to type it up rather than writing it out. And when I get to the grading part of this, I might be grading others on a general rubric uh, based on different elements and components. But for some of my students, I might just give them a check saying, good job, I loved how you did this. I might keep it as evidence so that as they get better and better at this, I can have an incredible amount of work to show their parents, to show the state, to show my principal how they've increased and how they're able to now write a couple words for a personal narrative versus just a few pictures. There are so many more accommodations and modifications. I'm only skimming the surface. I'm always coming up with new ideas and making more videos. So if there are things that you would love to see and you're really curious about and you want them to be in some type of video visual format, please let me know. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. And until next time, bye.